good evening once again. I'll tell you, I was uh, talking to Sylvia out there, and there are those rare Sundays where I'm not. It's not my rotation to teach Sunday school. Pastor Rob is preaching Sunday morning and Sunday night, and either. Elevate doesn't meet on Sunday night or somebody else would be in there speaking to them. And those Sundays can get rather boring for me. Because when God has called you to preach, that's the one, that's what you really like to do. So today has been rather, uh, it's been a joy for me. And so I thank you for letting me come and speak to you again this evening. Tonight we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And this past Wednesday... We had a, uh, a guest in Elevate, Danny Rumpel, was able to come by and talk to those in Team Kid who are studying missions and then having a missionary here. I stole him and brought him up to Elevate so he could uh, speak to them uh, about missions as well. So we kind of took a break somewhat this past Wednesday from what we had normally been talking about throughout the summer, which is evangelism. That's what we're studying in Elevate on Wednesday nights. And since we're in here tonight and not out there, I figured tonight would be the night to catch up. So we're going to talk about evangelism tonight. So you're going to get a little bit, of, you're going to get a little taste of what Elevate has been doing uh, on Wednesdays. So far, we've looked at several different things the Bible speaks to in regards to evangelism. We've looked at the Acts 1-8 model of how we're supposed to evangelize, beginning right where we are, then going to those people who are very similar to us, uh, but that we don't know, the Jerusalem, then the Judea, and then to the Samaria, those that are a lot like us, but there's some cultural differences that are there, and then to the ends, ends of the earth, to all people. We've looked at how that each and every one of us are called to go to all people, that the gospel is for everybody and we don't exclude anybody when we go and evangelize. And we've also looked at some of the excuses, which are many, that get in the way of us evangelizing. So tonight we're going to continue along uh, in this study on evangelism. And since it's elevated and not a normal Sunday evening service, and I'm acting like I can talk to them I get to bring along visual aids to help me teach so these here are some of the wonderful tools I have in my tool collection Miss Sylvia knows them well because she makes me use them quite regularly when she shows up <laughs> Still got an amen from brother Stan these are some of the ones that I either like to use or whenever I like to do the things that require them to be used although I may not like them in and of themselves. The drill is one of my favorite tools that we have because it's a power tool and men like power tools. Uh, It's got inside of it a tiny, tiny little thing. Bailey, can you see what this is? Since you were making faces at me earlier, I'm going to pick on you right now. Do you know what that is? It's called a drill bit. It's a little piece of metal that goes into the drill to help it do various things. You know what this is called? It's the same thing. It's a drill bit, that's right. This is rather odd. Really comes in handy when you're putting in doorknobs. It's called a hole saw. You attach this to the end of your drill and when you turn it on, it makes a hole. This is the one Sylvia likes for me to use a lot. It's called an anchor. You make the hole in the wall, you put this in and it lets the screw grab onto something when there's not a stud there. All these are various tools that, that I've got in my tool collection, among others, but I wanted to show you some of them tonight because that's exactly how we are in evangelism. Each one of these tools serves a different purpose. Each one of them differs from the other in just either in a drastic way or just in a very tiny way, but there's still a difference. And in evangelism... We are the same way. We as Christians are called to be part of the body of Christ. But how do we all fit together? What is the way that God, how does He make all of us mesh? And that's what we're going to look at tonight. 
So we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading in verse 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Paul opens up this this passage that we're looking at to let us know each and every one of us who is part of the body of Christ has been given a gift. We have been given a gift from God. But that these gifts, it says here in verse 4, there's diversities of gifts. They differ. Each person is gifted differently than another person. Now, that lets us know we're not all called to do the same thing. And bear in mind, we're talking about evangelism and the ultimate goal of spreading the gospel to the world. But in doing so, in carrying out that grand mission, each and every one of us, we're not all going to be called to do the exact same thing. Like these. All of them are part of my tool collection. All of them serve a purpose to either build something or tear up something, depending on what I'm doing. Uh, But not each one of them is going to work the exact same way. Not each one of them is going to do the same job in the process. That's the way you and I are. God has called each each one of us to something, to do something within His body, and the calling can vary widely. The Bible lists, and we're not going to go into all of them here because it lists in 1 Corinthians. Peter wrote about them. It's in Ephesians. It's in Romans. There are several different gifts that God has listed in His Word that He has given to His people. Some of the callings that people are going to have could be a calling to be a pastor. That's one we like that we know that God calls people to do. It could be a calling to be a missionary. That's a pretty prominent one. But God can also call people into things that we don't think about necessarily. God can call people to work in music. Okay, we kind of see that one. Some people, okay, we we think of that one on our own. God can call people to work in the nursery. God can call people to be the one who goes on visitation. God can, do, God can call us into all sorts of different fields, so many that we don't necessarily wrap our mind around it all the time, but each one of them He uses for His purpose. And it can even vary within those. One of our counselors at camp, Jonathan, he was telling me that he was going to Anderson College down there in South Carolina. Uh, And he was going on to seminary after that. He felt God was calling him into the ministry. That God was calling him to pastor. But he told me that the calling God had put on him was to pastor and work with dying churches. Never heard anybody tell me that, but that was the burden God put on his heart. That's a very unique calling. So when God calls people in his body to do various things, we can't put a limit on it. And they're going to be different. But the similarity is that all of them, it says in verse 6, six, it is the same God who works all in all. The similarity is that it's supposed to be God working through us. He has gifted you in such a way that He can work out His will, live His life through you. You don't get to pick whatever gift God has given you. That's the part that some of us don't really like. We would like to pick what God has what God would call us to do. Uh, I would not have picked that God would call me to stand up one day and open His Word and preach it to other people. That's not, if you would have asked me several years ago, what I thought God would put on my heart, but that's what He did. The gifts that He gives us are designed to do nothing more than to let Him live through us. And when God says, here's my goal, to spread the gospel through the, to the whole world, and the church is going to be how I'm going to do it, He can say, I want to use this person to do this part of the job, and this person to do this part of the job, and this person to do this part of the job. And the person, the Bible says, doesn't get to pick which job that is. Just like I can't tell the drill one day that, or the drill tell me that it's going to be a hammer. Now, I've used the drill as a hammer, and it doesn't work out that well. You may have seen other people do that, and that's when they're getting really frustrated. But you can't, it can't tell me, I'm not a drill, I'm a hammer. 
Because I can look at it and say, no, you're not. I know what it is. And that's the way God intended for it to be with you and me. To let Him live through us. And along the same lines, verse 7 tells us that He is the one that gave us the gift. He is the one that gave it to us. None of those tools got to decide what they were going to be. None of those tools got to decide, this is how I'm going to be used. Who decided that? Well, with, uh, let's see, I believe that drill bit is a craftsman or a black, it's one of those, I don't remember. But whatever company made it, it decided this is what it's going to be. Who decides how it gets used? I do. Because I'm the one that uses it. The maker gets to decide how it's going to be. The user gets to decide how it's going to be used. That's the way you and I should be with God. We are supposed to be nothing more than a tool. We're not the builder. We're not the maker. We're the tools God uses to do those things. So when God says, I want to go throughout the whole world, I want my message to be to every human. I want it to go to the ends of the earth. The Bible says that we're supposed to be the tools that he gets to use to carry that out. We're supposed to be the tools he gets to use. Now, it is obvious from this that God has either saved you or wants to save you for a purpose. If you are saved, you are saved for a purpose. If you're not saved, he wants to save you and he's got a purpose for you. Okay? The plan he's got for you advances his kingdom. It furthers the gospel. That's the whole point of of what we do, is to spread the gospel and give it to people that don't have it. And each and every one of his children are a part of this. Now, if we are all called and gifted differently, then how is God... Going to use us? Does he use us as individuals? Can we be used on our own? Just like these tools, if I'm going to hang a picture in Connie's office, to use Sylvia as an example again. If I'm going to hang a picture in Connie's office, is there any one tool here that that is all I can use and get the job done? Not if I want it to be done successfully. Not if I want the picture to stay on the wall. Not if I want it to look right and be what it's supposed to be. There's not. God's kingdom works the exact same way. You and I are not called to spread the gospel alone. You're called to spread the gospel in your own life. You're called to carry the message everywhere you go. But in the big picture, it's not all on you. And you don't get to be the the lone wolf guy who says, I'm just going to go do my own thing. And God's going to be happy with that because that's what God's called me to do. That's not what God's called you to do. Back in our text in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning, jump on down to verse 12. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. You and I are all part of the body of Christ. This is one of the great truths of the gospel. Is that we are all different. We come from different places. We are born in different areas of the country, maybe even different parts of the world. We are raised different ways. We come from different cultures even. We talk different. We act different. We dress different. We do all those things. But God said in His Word that when you get saved, we are all baptized. We are all put into one body, the body of Jesus Christ. Now, that means that we are all put together to make up a whole. One body. One whole picture. Just like I can use none of these on its, on its own to make up or to tear down, or do really anything, anything successfully, anything right, anything that's going to be lasting, I can't use any of the tools down here to do that. We're the same way. We are all dependent upon each other. 
the drill needs the right bit to put the hole in the wall. Then it needs the anchor to go in. Then it needs to change bits so we can put the screw in the wall into the anchor that will actually hold it. But if it's going to be putting in something bigger, it may need a bigger bit. It may need a hole saw to make a hole in something, whereas the little tiny one would take, it would burn up the drill trying to get that done. They are all dependent on the next one. They are all dependent on something else, and they all need each other to complete the job. And so they are all put in one tool collection that I have. We are all put into one body as Christians. When you get saved, you are put into the body of Christ. And notice here in verse 13. Verse 13 is one of the great verses in the Word of God. You can't look at anybody any different and honestly believe 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. Notice that in that verse, Jews and Greeks, slaves and free, what do you have? You've got different races, you've got different cultures, you've got different upbringings, different religious backgrounds, you've got different social status, you've got different wealth status, you've got all sorts of differences that are made up in here and Jesus said none of it matters. Because when Jesus came and paid for sin, he didn't just pay it for the wealthy and he didn't just pay it for the free person and he didn't just pay it for those that knew a little bit about God beforehand. He paid it for everybody. And we are all put into one body. We are all put into the body of Christ. And that is where our identity is found. That is where we really find out who we are. None of these tools are a lesser part of my collection than any of the others. None of them because they look different, because some of them are black and red, some of them are silver, some of them are dirty, some are clean. None of them are any less a part of my collection than any other one or any of the others that I have that I didn't bring with me. They are all part of it, just like you and I are all part of Christ. This is the message that we're trying to take to the world. As a little side note, this is what we're trying to take to everybody else, is that my Jesus is your Jesus. It's the same one. You don't have to do anything special to be able to have Jesus. Or you're not excluded from Jesus. When Jesus came, the Bible says that he came to pay for the sin of all the earth, of everybody. He didn't just pay for the sin of those that would get saved, and he didn't just pay for the sin of the select few. He paid for the sin of everybody. And all those, everyone, every person can be brought in to this whole, can be brought into this body. And that's a great fact to know. We're talking here, and I promise I'll get back to it, but we're talking about spreading the gospel. We're talking about carrying the message to the rest of the world. How hard would it be if God said, I want you to go tell the world about Jesus, and uh, good luck with that. You're going to do it on your own. No, he didn't do that. You know, when you go, uh, if some of you, as you get older and you come out of high school, I know some of you have friends that have done this, and maybe some of you will do it. But if you decide to join the military, there's a concept that they teach you from day one, and that is you never go anywhere by yourself. They pair you up with somebody and you are with that person all the time. You are not allowed to go anywhere on your own. You haven't earned that right yet. But they teach you from day one, there's always somebody else there with you. That's the kind of culture they create. God works on the basis of the family, on the basis of the body. And when you get saved, it's not all on you. It's not all on you. God says, I want you to do your part, and I'm going to put you in this body, and everybody else is going to be doing their part too. And this is how I'm going to operate. I'm not going to have a bunch of individuals. I'm going to have a family out there working. Now, God does not want you to think, when we're spreading the gospel, when we're serving Him, that there's a hierarchy in this family. 
He does not want you to think that there's a different level of importance either. We're going to look here at how each of us carry out our calling. And we're going to look in the coming weeks at what some of those specific callings might be and how it actually, what it actually looks like whenever we use it. That's in the coming weeks. But here, we mentioned before that there are all sorts of different callings. Everything from the pastor and the missionary, the one that most people see and they recognize, all the way down to people who help park people's cars and uh, who serve food and people who clean churches for us. All the, and everything in between. That's the kind of a hierarchy that people would want to put on it. And God said there's not one. And that's what we're going to look at. That none of us, whatever calling God puts on your life, whatever he says, I want you to do. When he says, Kyler, this is what I've called you to do and I want you to go do it. Joseph, here's yours. This is where you're going to serve me. Whatever that is, all of it is vitally important. Look back here, verse 20. But now indeed, there are many members, that's you and me, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having give greater honor to the part which lacks it. That there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. All of my tools here have a different job. If I was going to do any sort of task with them, is there any one tool that I could leave out and it wouldn't be missed. I went through hanging a picture earlier. The bit to make the hole, the anchor to put in, the bit to put the screw in, the drill that manages those. Is there any one of those that I could do without and it not affect the rest of them? No, there's not. That's this passage here. That's what this is talking about. This is how you and I operate. Look at the illustration that he just gave. He says, can an eye say to a hand, I've got no need for you. I am more important than you, so the body doesn't need you anymore. Have you ever had an eye that you couldn't use for whatever reason? It becomes... Uh, rather difficult to function, including with your hands. It's very hard to be able to see something and know that you want it and not be able to go out there and get it. Or it's very hard to be able to go out there and get something and not be able to see what you just got. I remember in football practice one time, we're running sprints, and we had taken our helmets off, uh, and a gnat, little old bitty annoying bug, or a no -seam or what I don't know if y'all have no seams up there or not up here or not. They're the little tiny bugs that you can just barely see flying in front of your face. I don't know what it was, but whatever it was, flew into my eye and sat in the corner of my eye. Well, if you haven't been around me whenever I don't have them in, I wear contacts. And if you wear contact lenses, anything that you get on your eyeball, the pain is greatly magnified. So the only thing I could think to do is I have to get my contact lens off my eye. Well, I did, sacrificing the all-important contact lens because, number one, I wasn't paying for them then, and number two, I didn't want the pain to really start. And lo and behold, it was still on there. Having one eye down, the psychology and, and uh, all those classes in school that we rarely paid attention in would teach you that depth perception all of a sudden starts to not have everything that it needs to have. Here, in the example that the Bible gives, how can the eye say to any part of the body, I don't need you? I can see that and I want to go out there and grab it. I can see the steak on my plate and I want to grab my fork and start eating it. But I don't need the hand. The Bible says that's foolish. That can't happen. 
It says, how can the head say to the feet, I've got no need of you? Imagine being able to think of somewhere you want to go and something you want to do, and you can't go do it. You don't have You can just sit around and think about it all the time. The feet are vitally important to actually getting the body up and moving and carrying out whatever just went into the mind. That's an anatomy lesson from the Bible, but it gives a really good illustration in how the body works. There is no part that any other part can look at and say, we don't need you anymore. There is no job that God has put in His people's hearts. Whatever He calls you to do, nobody can look and say, we don't need you. Nobody can look and say, that job is not that important and we can do without it. And it also makes perfectly clear, verse 26, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. That when one of us are lacking, if I decided, okay, whatever God called Rachel to do, um, I'm a pastor and I'm more important than that, so we're going to put whatever God called her to do and we're going to set it off here to the side till I get what I think I deserve and then we'll bring Rachel up at that point. But until then, that's not that important and we don't have a need of that just yet. If I decide to do that, if I operate that way, the way the Bible words it is that's not just going to make her suffer. That's not just going to make her ministry suffer. It's going to make everybody suffer. It's going to make everybody, the whole body, hurt. If God calls us to evangelize the world and we start putting off the calling of God on other, of other people and we start pushing it off to the side and saying that's not important or even God saying, here's what I want you to do and you saying, eh, it's not really that important. I think I'd rather do this. We're making the goal that God has given us that much harder. We're not carrying it out the way God wants and we're actually hurting the cause. Let me ask you this. If I decided to not do my job, I'm the youth and children's pastor here at the church, who suffers? You want to answer, don't you, Joseph? No? You were just raising your hand saying you? So if I don't do my job, Joseph suffers. Joseph's right. If I decide that I'm going to come one day and close up my Bible and I'm going to sit and play on the computer all day and draw a paycheck and never really put forth any effort, Joseph's is saying he's going to suffer. The Bible says here that he's right. If one member is lacking, everybody else is going to suffer. It's going to have a ripple effect. It's going to, if I lack, it's going to make Joseph suffer. And then that's going to make Demichel, his sister, suffer. And then it's going to start to spread throughout the youth group. And then it's going to affect the entire church because it's going to permeate out of them. It's going to affect their witness it's going to affect where they go in life and it's going to affect their calling because they've watched their pastor neglect his calling. The ripple effect, we cannot measure how many people we touch with our ministry. The calling God's put on you, understand that when God says, I want you to evangelize the world and here's your specific part, here is what you do, God is seeing it from up here. God is seeing it on the big the big plane, the big picture. Like the architect, when a building is being built, he sees the whole thing. The carpenter is worried about the two by four in front of him. God is up here, and he's saying, I want you to do this. He knows how important that is. He knows the lives you're going to touch. Maybe it's one, maybe it's a million. We don't know. But whenever one of us suffers, everybody suffers. Whenever one of us lacks, everybody lacks. Now, it's very easy to think about me being a pastor. What if I decide to not do my job? What if, and I know some of y'all have sat out there before, or I believe some of you have anyway. What if Mary Ann decides she's not going to do her job anymore in the nursery? She's not going to watch the kids. How many parents are now not going to be able to come sit in worship? 
a bunch because we got a ton of kids out there. So how many parents are not going to get fed? And then they're not going to be able to feed their own children. How many times is service going to be disrupted? I don't know. The role she plays is vitally important and most people never even stop to consider that if somebody's not out there with the kids, parents can't be in here and worship can't go like it does. And then these parents can't go home and give the word of God to their kids from, from that nursery stage all the way up until they're out of their house. And in a lot of places, in a lot of churches, that's the least thought about job in the church. I actually know of a church where me and Sarah moved from where the uh, nursery worker, I don't believe you even had to be saved to work in the nursery. They would just put an ad in the paper and somebody could come watch the kids during service and it was really just whoever. No real background, no, they, they didn't really check you out or anything. It could just be anybody off the street. If they liked you, whoever was hiring, they, you got the job. didn't matter if you were an older lady. It didn't matter if you were a teenager. No thought at all given to who was watching the kids. Giving, no thought was given to making sure kids were taken care of. That's something we have to, that we have to watch. That's, that's a ministry that is so vitally important. And everywhere in between. Everything in between is the way God looks at it. But I know that there will be some of you at some point because every one of us in here who's been called by God to do something has thought at some point that my calling is not important. That I could stop doing what I'm doing and God would put somebody else in or somebody else would step up or nobody would ever miss me. That's a lie from Satan. Satan wants you to believe that. He wants you to stop working. I don't care if, you're, if whatever God gifts you to do, some of you may know, some of you may not. Some of you may have an idea, some of you maybe even have never thought about it before right now. Whatever God gifts you to do, it's important, but it would be, become very easy to think that it's not. Even if it's something small. And I'll give you... One last illustration. You know what a stone bruise is? Did Michelle, you play sports. Do you know what a stone bruise is? No. No. It's a bruise that would, that's very easy to get from a stone, from a little rock. It's a bruise that, it's like a bone bruise. It hurts, and it's a bruise, but it never shows up. I've gotten those before. That it's real easy to get them on your feet, especially when you're an athlete because you're running and jumping and doing all sorts of stuff. I've gotten them on my heel and on my big toe. You ever hurt your big toe? Yeah, yeah. You don't really think that that would be that important a part of your body, but it is. It is vitally important. You know what hurts whenever you hurt your big toe? Everything, everything hurts because now all of a sudden it becomes hard to walk and you don't want to walk on your big toe so you're walking on the outside of your foot and now your foot hurts, then your ankle hurts, then your leg hurts and it just keeps moving up and it takes those things forever it seems like to go away. The big toe is one of the, it's a vitally important part of your body because it helps balance you and it helps, you make, it helps make you walk right. Your thumbs are important because, you know, we don't ever really, it's a thumb. It is what it is. Without the thumb, you, we can't grip stuff like we can. God made us so wonderfully. And the, the Bible makes it clear here that those parts that seem to not have any honor at all, God gave more honor to. When you go and you hurt your big toe or you hurt your thumb, you very quickly realize the ripple effects that start to go through. Yeah, we can start to see ripple effects pretty easy and we can even imagine them whenever we get a blister in your mouth. You ever got a blister in your mouth and then gone and eat french fries? Yeah, yeah. Everybody in here that's done that just made a noise. Yeah, that's real fun. You learn real quick that now all of a sudden you start to watch what you eat. You start to watch what you drink. You're probably eating and drinking less than you were and you're praying to God that it goes away. 
But could you imagine something if you didn't have eyelashes? That doesn't seem like that important part of the body. If you don't have those, good luck with the dust that's going to be in your eye all day long. Because that's what they do is they help keep things out of your eye. The point is, Paul is using the example here of the body. I was using the examples of a tool collection. The point is that if you think whatever God calls you to do, and I talked to some of you about this at camp, what God has gifted some of you with, and it's amazing, you don't even realize some of the things that God has gifted you with. If you think it is not important, God says you are so, so wrong. God does not waste His energy calling you to something that is not important. God does not waste His time giving you a gift that could just as easily be thrown in the trash as opposed to being put in one of His children. If God took the time to call you to a purpose, that purpose is important. When God saves us, He saves us for a purpose, and His purpose is to advance His kingdom. And this book tells me advancing His kingdom is something He takes pretty serious. Each and every one of us, we're called to evangelize. We are called to go and spread the gospel. And in doing so, God is never going to give you a calling that He doesn't prepare you for. He's never going to give you a calling and not give you the tools to carry out that calling. We talked about that. Remember, Rachel, the the spear and the knife killing the deer? Yeah, yeah. I'll give you the story. I gave them the illustration of being unequipped for whatever you're called to do, and Rachel told me she doesn't hunt. She's not an avid hunter. So I was telling her that would be like me sending her to a place I heard about in Florida where you can go deer hunt, and it's for these people who love to hunt. I mean, these serious ones who aren't just looking to kill an animal. They're looking for the challenge to kill the animal. When you go, this lodge or this reserve or whatever it is gives you a spear and a knife. And that's all you're allowed to use to kill this deer. And that would be like me sending you off to do that. You would be very unequipped to go and kill an animal that way. I would be. Most of us would be. God doesn't work that way. Whenever He calls you to go evangelize, He gives you every tool you're going to need. And they come from Him. They are gifts. It is only by His grace that we have them. But if we have them, we should use them. There's a good chance your gift is going to pull you out of your comfort zone. Some of you, I know what your comfort zone is. Because I've asked you to come out of it. And I get pushback from that. It's all right. God God calls you out of your comfort zone. This is not my comfort zone. I remember being in... The very first speech I ever had to give in school, I was up throwing up the night before. Because I did not want to speak in public. I did not want to do that. I avoided public speaking in college like the plague. Until I went back and the school told me, yeah, you got to take it. God calls us out of our comfort zone. He calls us into a place we don't really want to go. That's what He gifts us for normally. Because He wants to live through you. That's what the gift is for, to let Him use you. You be His tool. Not so you can go and do it on your own. Not so you can say, I did that. But so He can use you as His instrument. Each and every one of us who are saved, we are part of the body of Christ. And we have a calling on us. If you're not saved, I encourage you. To give your life to Jesus. And start having a purpose. Because right now you don't have one. If you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus. Your life has no purpose at all. But when you come to Jesus. He saves you for a reason. And he gifts you. He equips you. With every tool you need. To carry out that purpose. I would ask you. This is what I would send you home with tonight. Do you know what that purpose is? Do you know what God has called you to do with your life? Have you ever asked Him, God, what do you want me to do? God, have you, will you show me what you have given me the gift to do? And will you help me use it? That's a scary question to ask God. I'll, I'll admit, because you never know what He can come back with. Maybe He says, yeah, I called you to be a missionary. Or maybe he says, yeah, I called you to watch kids. 
Or, yeah, I called you to cook meals. Or, yeah, I called you to go visit people outside of church. I don't know. I don't know what it is. But when we ask Him and He answers, if we will follow Him and let Him use us, we will advance His kingdom and you'll have more joy than you could possibly imagine. Yeah, it may be scary to be called to be a missionary, but if that's what God's called you to do, you'll have more joy You'll have more joy than you could possibly imagine serving Him that way. And you will not have that joy anywhere else. To stay up to date on current events at the church, check service times, or if you have questions about the Bible, please visit us at lbchurch.com or call 740-678-2738. Thanks for listening.